from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this uh, talk by Jason Stahl. And uh, for the introduction, we're happy to have Klaus Laris with us today, who is former holder of the Kissinger Chair here at the Library of Congress and is currently on the faculty of the University of Ulster. So, Klaus. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. Appreciate it. Good afternoon. I have the great pleasure of introducing Jason Stahl to you, our sp uh, speaker today. I also see the Librarian of Congress, Dr. Billington, in the audience, and I would like to extend my welcome to you. Jason is a holder of the Jameson Fellowship in American History here at the Library of Congress. The Jameson Fellowship is awarded jointly by the Library of Congress and the American Historical Association. This fellowship is named in honor of J. Franklin Jameson, the founder of the AHA, former chief of the library's manuscript division, and first holder of the library's chair of American history. It is a very distinguished fellowship, and naturally, the competition to obtain it is very hard indeed. Of course, we are very pleased that Jason is our latest award holder. Jason Stahl was educated at the University of Minnesota, where he obtained both his MA and his PhD in modern history. He has been in residence at the library for the last couple of months. He is busy converting his PhD dissertation on the influence and impact of conservative American think tanks into a book. It is entitled The Right Moves, the Think Tank in American Political Culture from 1916 to the Present. I hope I'm not giving away a secret by saying that the editors at Cambridge University Press are currently reading his manuscript with great interest. Incidentally, Jason's surname, Stahl, means steel in German, and I can assure you that his book manuscript is, uh, has a solid and thorough quality that we associate with steel in general. <laughs> In his manuscript, as in his talk today, Jason deals with elite conservatism in the form of think tanks such as the American Enterprise Institute, founded as far back as 1943. Jason uses his investigations of the cultural role of the American think tank in the years since 1945 to demonstrate the merging of political and institutional history with social cultural history. He analyzes how organizational forces, including post-war American think tanks, have worked to shape and limit political and policy debates in the United States. As you can tell, this is indeed a formidable and highly interesting task, but also a task lo long neglected by historians. Jason has used the papers of AEI President William Berudi, Barry Goldwater, and many others as a foundation for his study. And he not only talks about the American Enterprise Institute, but also about Brookings, the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, Heritage, and some other think tanks. Jason's talk today is situated within this general framework. Initially, he will tell us what made him choose this topic, what made him apply for the Distinguished Jameson Fellowship at the Library of Congress, and last but not least, he will analyze the influence of the American Enterprise Institute on the rise of conservatism in the 1970s. As you know, the 1970s were a highly important decade. After all, I finished high school in that decade, and there were also some minor incidents, <laughs> such as the resignation of an American president, the death of Chinese dictator Mao, the revolution in Iran, and the Russian invasion of Afghanistan. Not least, the 1970s have shaped the nature and direction of American politics until the very present. Ladies and gentlemen, I have great pleasure in presenting Jason Stahl, who will talk about conservatives in a marketplace of idea, think tanks, and interests in the 1970s. Jason. Thank you, Klaus. I appreciate the old German pronunciation of my last name, which I don't get to hear often. Um, I should thank at the outset the American Histo uh, Historical Association, um, the uh, Library of Congress, of course, um, the Kluge Center, Klaus as well, and thanks and good afternoon. A as Klaus suggested, I, with this talk, I want to sort of talk to you about a, a before and an after in the way that this is a long-term book, a dissertation to book project. So what I want to sort of go through here is how the work I've done here at the library has really altered my thinking on this long-term project of mine. So about a year ago, as Klaus said, I did defend my dissertation, a post-World War II history 
of the rise and historical development of the conservative think tank. For those unfamiliar, conservative think tanks are best understood as research and public relations institutions that house conservative intellectuals. In this dissertation, I attempted to make the case that conservative think tanks emerged in the post-war period as sites designed for theorizing and selling uh, conservative pu public policies and ideologies to, to lawmakers and the public at large. Because of this emergence and because of the power they came to wield, my broadest argument, my broadest claim in the dissertation was that think tanks were instrumental in the turn away from New Deal liberalism towards a more conservative government orientation. They helped and continue to help plan all sorts of conservative public policies and have been instrumental in getting more and more Americans to accept the identity conservative. In writing this work, I, I'm writing against much of the history of the field as it's been practiced for the last 20 or so years. Over this time, historians of post-war conservatism have been primarily focused on what's come to be known in the field as grassroots conservatism. This moniker was popularized by Michael Kazin, a man of the left himself, who's a political historian, and in 1992 wrote a very influential book review, basically imploring historians to, um, quote, overcome our cosmopolitan cultural tastes and liberal and radical politics to study the right. Kazin stressed in particular the need for social historians to use the methodologies of social history that is to study up, so to study political movements from the grassroots. As Kazin put it, the left political leanings of most historians had, had led them to neglect, quote, research projects about past movements that seem bastions of a crumbling status quo or the domain of puritanical pathological yahoos. Other well-known political historians at the time, including Alan Brinkley and Eric Foner, were urging scholars, including their own students, to move in this direction, so to study the right from the bottom up. Thus, since the early 90s, historians of the American right have been creating this whole new field, um, which really looks at this sort of bottom-up way of, of examining conservative social movements. The results of such a turn have been nothing short but ast of astounding, moving the field in a new and positive direction. Taken together, the studies of the past 20 years have gone a long way to furthering our understanding of modern conservatism. However, with this passing of this old project, that is political historians not studying the right and only studying the left, I argue that there emerges a new dilemma. And that's that we tend to now, um, in our grassroots orientation, obscure sites of elite conservatism, which were equally important to understanding the conservative resurgence in the final quarter of the 20th century. Thus, this is where my project comes in to bring in a site of elite conservatism, the think tank, into our overall understanding of the field. So, this is what I knew before I came to the Library of Congress. However, in the past year that I finished the dissertation stage of my project and now working to turn this into a book, uh, I've begun to think about my own biases as I study an elite political movement. When one writes such histories, there's a sort of specter that hangs in the air, the, the conspiracy theorist. So people assume that I'm studying these elite institutions and sort of about how they're hatching all sorts of uh, plans. Um, the specter hung over and, and warning me that if I ever wanted to be taken seriously as an academic historian, I need to studiously avoid suggestions of conspiracy theories um, by rigorously documenting my work in the archives. I, I'm partly joking, of course, here, but what, the, what this did mean in practice is that I was careful probably too careful when suggesting the role of raw monetary interests and the role they played in the development of conservative think tanks. This is not to say that I ignored the fact that conservative think tanks were funded by corporations and the very wealthy. This continues to be the case. But I do think that I had a bias against putting these interests front and center in my narrative. Instead, I believed and continue to believe that the people I study wholly accept the ideologies that they are promoting. So who am I to assert that this is primarily a project about upward wealth distribution? This dilemma then is at least in part why I ended up here. Uh, I came here to further examine this question of material interest versus ideas in the formation of the conservative think tank. And to better account for how the two interacted to, cr to really give the rise to the conservative think tank to a position of importance in American political culture. But why the Library of Congress? Well, 
as Klaus suggests, well, it is not to assert a conspiracy, but conservative think tanks don't keep accessible archives. This presents a problem for historians who are trained that we are supposed to go to archives and, and uh, build a, a sort of truth-building project. Okay? So much of the time I've spent with this project has been dealing with this very large problematic. The Library of Congress, however, has saved me in some ways, as it contains the papers of William J. Baruti. Baruti was the primary mover of one of the largest conservative think tanks here in DC, the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research, or the AEI. From 1954 to 1962, he was executive vice president of the think tank, and from 1962 to 1978, he was its president. AEI has been around in various forms longer than any other conservative think tank. Thus, access to Broody's personal and organizational papers have obviously helped me to understand this, this interaction between how material interests are at play and how ideas are at play in bringing the think tank to power. And I must say that my time with the Broody papers over this past month has changed my thinking on this question. However, rather than continue to posit some uh, judicial scales metaphor whereby we have monetary interests on one hand and ideas on the other, and that if one goes up, the other one must go down and vice versa, I want to talk today about the way the two work together. To do so, I want to turn to the decade of the 1970s, one that has been somewhat neglected by American historians until rather recently, um, and, dis and discuss the growth of the conservative think tank in this period. During this decade, for a variety of reasons I'll deal with in a moment, conservative think tanks saw a massive increase in the amount of funding they received. These new monies obtained largely from wealthy families, individuals, and corporations had the obvious effect of increasing the political and cultural power of these institutions. More research could be produced, more media appearances could be had, and more conservative legislation could be written. However, beyond this obvious linking together of the material and the ideological in the power of the think tank, I want to argue today that they work together in a far more powerful way. In essence, the drastically increased funding of the conservative think tank in this period, and how this funding was justified, created a whole new discourse of public policy expertise, which greatly benefited conservatism as a political movement. This new discourse, one of which I will characterize as a marketplace of ideas, brought about a shift where ideological differences and balancing these differences in a marketplace became a value in and of itself. Indeed, it became the highest valued commodity of all in a decade that was increasingly skeptical of institutional liberalism. As conservative work to drive home the point that liberal institutions, academia, foundations, liberal think tanks were dominating a marketplace of ideas, they opened up a whole new avenue to their own relevance, one which positioned institutions like the conservative think tank as necessary competition in a, to a liberal intellectual monolith. Thus, not only did the, this new, clearly somewhat biased funding of conservative think tanks not matter, the bias created by it was actually highly sought after in a marketplace of ideas. This created a massive shift to a new language of public policy argumentation, one which would greatly aid in shifting policy discussions to the right and would allow conservatives entrance into public policy debates by virtue of their identity as conservative. It was merely enough that they could create competition with institutions that were deemed hopelessly liberally biased. This shift, one which I'll characterize as from belief to being, created a new dominant discourse of public policy expertise and debate, which I would argue still exists to this day. However, such a discourse had not always been operative in policy debates in the United States. When AEI emerged in 1943 as the American Enterprise Association, or the AEA, there existed a deep suspicion of any organization that claimed to speak on behalf of business or corporations in general. With the memory of the Depression not far from Americans' minds, anything that smacked of a business association um, was immediately deemed suspect. And think tanks, emerging think tanks of this period, knew they had to tread lightly when abdicating for particular policies. AEA's head, Lewis H. Brown, who was also the president of the Johns Mansville Corporation, understood this well. 
He knew that his organization, a partnership of top executives and leading business and financial firms, would have this bias immediately taken into account when promoting public policy. Thus, in his opening speech, speeches for the organization, Brown tended to couch the nascent think tank's interest in diplomatic language, such as the need to, quote, re-educate every man, woman, and child in a deep faith in the American way. He also engaged in one of the most acceptable forms of conservative discourse at the time, anti-communism, when he declared all liberal reform could be a Trojan horse for Marxism itself. Finally, Brown took up a familiar and somewhat popular conservative cause as the think tank's first public policy pronouncement, that of foreign aid. Uh, after visiting post-war Germany, Brown and AEA commissioned a 250-page report, um, which, according to Business Week, suggested, quote, rebuilding Germany is at the heart of Western Europe as fast as possible to get Germany off the backs of the American taxpayer. Nevertheless, even small interventions into public policy discussions such as this drew the ire of regulators disciplined by the Depression to be skeptical of these kinds of organizations that I'm talking about. Thus, in 1950, the House Lobby Investigating Committee began an investigation of the think tank, which in turn led it to be, quote, named a big business pressure organization, as the committee cited correspondence among its officials to indicate a Republican Southern Democrat coalition favorable to large corporations. This was a problem at the time. The committee also said that the AEA should have, quote, to register under the Federal Lobbying Act as a lobbying organization. Okay, so there was this disciplining of these organizations, of these newly forming post-war conservative organizations because of this memory of the Great Depression. In addition to this collective memory of the Depression, that are also by the 50s and 60s emerged what histo American historians now call a period of liberal consensus. This is a problematic phrase, but it gets at a certain truth, which is that social scientists and politicians were deemed capable of defining social problems and then coming up with solutions using proper scientific, social scientific techniques. This dominant understanding of liberal technocratic expertise then meant that business-oriented groups like AEA were deemed suspect for this reason as well. Baruti understood this dynamic very well. Uh, thus, when he came on as president of AEA in 62, he immediately changed the name to the American Enterprise Institute, so as to distance from a business association association. Um, while adopting the more sort of academic sounding institute. Despite his deeply uh, conservative personal orientation, Baruti attempted to reposition the organization within the liberal technocratic ideal so as to make it newly relevant. A 1962 letter Baruti sent to AEI's director of special projects is instructive in this regard. I'll try to put my longer quotes up here so you don't have to track my voice the whole time. The institute does not protect does not press any particular public policy position or even attempt to form, suggest, or support any particular public policy position. The Institute does attempt to provide the research assistance which will bring to bear upon any policy consideration the most pertinent facts available and the most knowledgeable considerations by acknowledged authorities in the field. So you see this very sort of technical language attempting to find this relevance within the already sort of existing paradigm. In this way and at this time, Baruti made an astute political calculation that the foundations of the liberal technocratic ideal were not to be challenged, but rather a new path to relevance for AEI would be found through a strict adherence to this ideal. In some ways this worked, as AEI was very much revived during the 60s, during his early tenure. Um, really by issuing these primers, there's thousands and thousands of primers of just rigorously trying to present balanced interpretations of legislation. So there's just, you know, this kind of back and forth and these very small primers and they would send them out to congressmen and all sorts of people. Uh, so this isn't to suggest though that Bar Baruti was not part of an emerging conservative movement in the 60s, only that he did not yet see in 62 that AEI could be part of this movement. However, his own personal orientation as a devout con conservative Catholic attracted him and other AEI folks to the 1964 Barry Goldwater for President campaign. Um, he and others took leave of the think tank to run a brain trust for Goldwater. 
This leave of absence did not shield, him from, shield, shield them from scrutiny or shield the organization from the same kind of scrutiny, though. Lyndon Johnson, never one to uh, leave a political opponent unpunished, uh, undoubtedly was behind the mysterious, this mysterious IRS audit of AEI after the campaign was over. AEI never, nevertheless emerged with this tax-exempt status, but scrupulously it adhered to the kind of ideal, I think, that's represented in this letter. However, AEI and other conservative organizations begin to rethink the foundations of this model as the nation went through this sort of collective convulsions that are now known as 1968. As liberal technocrats increasingly came to be blamed for a whole host of problems, including urban blight, rioting, fiscal and monetary problems, and obviously the war in Vietnam. Conservatives begin to identify the whole liberal technocratic edifice as the fundamental problem. A July 1968 uh, Baruti letter to corporate funders of AEI demonstrates this new emerging critique. While making an appeal to the objective, nonpartisan research of AEI, Baruti nevertheless situates liberal technocrats as the fundamental source of the nation's problems. Much of our thinking, and this is from his letter to these donors, much of our thinking at AEI is conditioned by a conviction that the intellectual community plays an increasingly major role in the formation of public policy. In short, the conviction that most governmental programs, for example, enacted in the last 30 years, did not originate either in the mind of a politician or from the overwhelming, de over overwhelming demand of the people or from the planks of the party platform. They were born in and can trace their origins through the thought and writings of an academic or a group of academics whose views concerning the organization of society may not necessarily coincide with yours in mind. It is in quotes such as this, then, that you can see what I'm arguing is this shift to this marketplace of ideas discourse. Baruti is beginning the counter-positioning of the conservative think tank to academia, liberal think tanks such as the Brookings Institution, and foundations such as the Ford Foundation, arguing that because these liberal technocrats in these organizations have planned policy without the conservative counterpoint, the nation has the problems that it does. Moreover, he's making the explicit case that these technocrats are in no way democratically accountable. They can merely impose their will on the nation. As the 60s turned into the 70s, this critique of the liberal establishment was ramped up full force from AEI and other conservative sites. Within the White House itself, uh, President Nixon issued an, issued an order in 1969 that, quote, all White House staff people as well as cabinet people are not to use the Brookings Institution because of its bias against conservatives and the administration. Nixon aide Tom Huston suggested an IRS audit of Brookings or even a break-in to, quote, foreshadowing things to come, to quote, go after the classified material which they have stashed over there, right? So there's this real sense that they're planning and plotting and hatching all these various schemes and there needs to be something done about it. In the end, however, it was suggested that the White House, quote, play the Brookings game itself through the development of a counter-establishment of conservative think tanks and foundations designed to promote conservative causes. Additionally, the memo suggested that they, quote, scare the living hell out of Brookings and paint it as pro-Hanoi and anti-American. Right? So you can see the way in which the, there's a sort of usefulness in sort of counter-positioning this new project. It was with this counter-establishment project that AEI would obviously come into play. In a 1970 in internal memo, a writer for the think tank declared that Liberal technocrats at Brookings have been engaging in, quote, an assault on the political, economic, and social structure of the country, end quote, which was, quote, largely financed by major infusions from financial resources from the Ford Foundation. You can see they're all sort of talking about the same thing around the same turn of the decade period. By 1971, letters to corporate and conservative foundations from Baruti were stressing the need to build this counter-establishment. So here Baruti, again, is writing to funders of this think tank. Essentially what is required is a serious effort to right the imbalance reflected by the continuing and even accelerating impact 
on, on public opinion formation and public policy determination. This cannot and ought not be attempted through action against such existing centers, the Ford Foundation Brookings. It can only be achieved by assuring similar resources to institutions and centers not similarly oriented. The goal of such an effort would be to make certain the American people are exposed to varying points of view on public policy issues. It is essentially that fair competition exists in the er arena of idea formation. So here we see this real shift, right? The liberal technocracy is here is deemed the problem, which can only be remedied by the shift to a, a marketplace of ideas as opposed to a monopoly. So you can see this sort of language of the market really infusing this new discourse. Under such a discourse, then, the bias of conservative and corporate funders who are being targeted with this letter is not a problem in the way it was before the, with the Depression and so on and so forth. It's not a problem, but rather a solution, which is needed to balance what is seen as a monolithic liberal establishment. Indeed, this particular discourse formation actually presents corporate and wealthy interests as fundamentally powerless as the little guys struggling to make their voices heard in a marketplace. By the time of Nixon's re-election in 1972, this establishment, counter-establishment critique had fully crystallized. And the wholesale shift in conservative funding priorities, as well as a shift this broader marketplace discourse was underway. In late 72, Nixon aide Pat Buchanan wrote a memo to the president arguing for the creation of, quote, a new cadre of Republican governmental professionals who can survive this administration and be prepared to take over future ones. A counter-conservative, government in exile, that's his phrase, institutes which could serve as the repository of conservative beliefs, end quote. Buchanan was skeptical that AEI could fill this bill, assuming they were wedded to this nonpartisan ideal. Uh, but little did he know, William Baruti was at the same time giving a talk entitled The Corporate Role in the, Dec in the Decade Ahead to a business council meeting. This is another sort of business-oriented conservative group at the time, which stressed the same point, albeit in language that stressed uh, corporate behavior as opposed to Republican behavior. In his speech, Baruti argued that the, quote, corporate class had abdicated the intellectual arena and were giving money to institutions like Brookings, the Ford Foundation, and universities which did not support their values. Returning to the marketplace metaphor, Baruti argued that corporations needed to break an intellectual monopoly. To break this monopoly requires a calculated positive major commitment, one which will ensure that the views of other competent intellectuals are given the opportunity to contend effectively in the mainstream of our country's intellectual activity. There are such people. They can be encouraged and mobilized. Their numbers can increase. But that can hardly happen without the reordering of priorities in the support, this is a confusing sentence, in the support patterns of corporations and foundations, at least by those corporations and foundations conserve, concerned with preserving the basic values of this free society and its free institutions. He's a very sort of rapping writer, sorry. Here we see, here we see Baruti, less than a decade after writing this AEI letter talking about scrupulously adhering to balanced presentations to all this sort of thing, fundamentally altering the project of AEI, openly declaring that the Institute had this, this new purpose, which was to, to openly advocate for, for the corporate class. Whereas the 62 letter is technical in its advocacy of objectivity, this speech is more akin to one given at a political rally, urging corporations to stand up for their values in an intellectual and monetary marketplace. As for the reordering of priorities advocated by Baruti in this speech, this quickened throughout the 70s. As corporations and conservative individuals, through their own foundations, begin to add their money and voices, money slash voices, to the marketplace of ideas. In 1970, AEI only had a budget, only had a staff of 18 and a budget of slightly more than a million dollars. But by the early 80s, the staff had increased to 150 and an annual budget of over $10 million. To take but one example of where this money was coming from, uh, it's worth noting that from the middle of 1969 to the middle of 1973, AEI received almost half of its $8 million budget over that time span from a single source, conservative millionaire Richard Millenscape. 
who along with Joseph Kurz and John Merrill Olin, used their foundations to really infuse think tanks like AEI and the Heritage Foundation, which is founded in 73, with new monies. Additionally, the vast resources were now uh, pouring into AEI coffers from corporations. By the middle of 74, Baruti had really honed his pitch to, the, to these folks using new, a new fundraising letter here. This draws off the earlier business council speech. Paul McCracken recently said, a free society can tolerate a monopoly in the production of widgets, but it cannot survive a monopoly in the public, in the public policy idea formation. I'm sorry, in public policy idea formation. The results of such a near monopoly in this intellectual community are clearly evident. It is certainly safe to say that the long-term trend line in public policy has been towards more rather than less regulation of business, towards higher rather than lower taxes on business, in short, towards more rather than less government intervention in the private sector. And growing public hostility to business is a fact. Effective competitions of ideas is the American Enterprise Institute's approach to the problem. So once again, we have the discourse of the market here being used to dissipate any sort of critique of, cor of corporate donations, as such donations are, wealthy, are, are welcome to create this new competition. But it was not only conservative institutions who were buying into this new emerging discourse. The institutions of the so-called liberal establishment begin to internalize this critique and sought to remedy it by, quote unquote, leveling the marketplace. Thus, in 1972, the Ford Foundation gives AEI a $300,000 grant. So this is the institution they've been critiquing you know, for several years, right? Gives them this new grant. And it also gives them two additional grants throughout the 70s. This gave both institutions credence to declare that they were working to level the marketplace by adding self-identified conservative voices to a competitive field. Likewise, tr traditional media sources, which are often situated, we still see to this day, as part of a liberal establishment with liberal bias, begin to turn to conservative think tanks in their stories in the name of balancing the marketplace. Many of these same sources also begin to do full page, you know, full spread stories on AEI, adding to its marketing and branding strategies. From 1975 to 1979, the New York Times, Newsweek, Business Week, the Los Angeles Times, Esquire, US News and World Report, among others, did lengthy promotional stories for the Institute, all of which stressed this competition of ideas framework. Uh, as an example, you can see this photo which accompanies the flyer from my talk here. This is from a 1976 Newsweek piece. So here we have Baruti on the left, uh, Irving Kristol, leading conservative intellectual at the time, works, uh, is on staff at AEI. Um, and you can see AEI's broody crystal, a counter bookings for right thinking, right? So this is just a, this is just a standard sort of news story and it, adopting wholesale, wholesale this framework. But in surely what was the ultimate coup for conservative organizers, the pillar of the li liberal technocratic establishment, Brookings, had by the middle of the decade declared its own internalization of the marketplace discourse of public policy and its abandonment of this liberal scientific expertise. A March 1977 LA Times article declares, Brookings needs help, help wanted, Republican, deep thinkers with high level of experience in government, economics, foreign affairs, White House background, helpful, apply Brookings Institution, Washington DC. Dignified Brookings isn't about to do anything as crude as place a want ad, but the fact is is that the renowned think tank many of which regard as a citadel of liberal democratic ideas, has a new president, Bruce K. McLaurie, who wants to recruit some prominent Republican scholars. McLaurie hopes to attain for Brookings a more balanced ideological image, and in the process to obtain more financial contributions from, from the corporate world. Then in 1978, U.S. News and World Report does a joint profile of AEI and Brookings, where we're given sort of similar rhetoric. Consequently, the key word at both organizations these days is diversity. There has to be a diversity of views to keep the place credible, explains McL Brookings McClory, himself a Republican. We don't want anyone looking at us and saying, there's a voice you have to be suspicious of because, because it speaks from a particular perspective. AEI's Bill Baruti Jr. summing up what think tanks are all about, Bill Baruti Jr., the son of the father I've been discussing, 
Puts it another way, what we want is a competition of ideas. So taking these news items together, uh, what we can see by now by the end of the decade is how there's been a full internalization of the conservative marketplace discourse of public policy by institutions that had been critiqued through this particular way of speaking. Brookings is seeking corporate donations in the name of ideological and material balance. It's hiring Republicans, including as its president, to offset concerns that it's too one-sided. And there's a full flipping of the discourse from the previous, uh, from the previous decade, where there's the, the new voice to be suspicious of is not corporations, but liberally-minded institutions. This new acceptance of the marketplace metaphor by the very institutions being critiqued by conservatives it is what truly leads to a hegemony of sorts for this particular way of speaking about policy. And so it was in the 1970s, where we see not only a shift to conservative policies, which would come to fruition under the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980, but also a wholesale new shift to this new way of argumentation. First and foremost, it this, this shift allowed the dissipation of concerns over corporate donations, as I've said, as merely another voice to level a marketplace of ideas. And also it, it created a shift from belief to being, from a content of policy to political identity as the most important factor, not the only factor, but the, I'm arguing the most important factor. This, I would argue, is the germination of the elite media discourse which we live with today where balancing public policy debates between two sides or competing sides in a marketplace of ideas takes precedent. Thank you. Step aside now. Thank you very much indeed for a very stimulating and interesting talk. It certainly also gave us a good overview of your work here and what you have done so far, <coughs> what you still intend to do. I'm sure you're prepared to take some questions. Of course. Let's open the floor. <laughs> Who would like to ask a question, please? <coughs> yes, please. As to, the fr as to the first question, I would say, uh, oh, I'm sorry. The first question is, how does, um, how does Nixon's resignation play into this process? Historians now, American historians of that period, really talk about Nixon's resignation as being fundamentally uh, working into conservative narratives of the time. You can't trust the federal government. So sort of paradoxically, there's a way in which um, uh, Republican failure becomes conservative success because it's, it's, it's feeding into their emerging forms of politics at the time. So that's how I would answer your first question. The second question is balance versus retrenchment. Um, I think that I, I don't necessarily see them as being uh, counterposed to one another, right? That you can, that what AEI is advocating for here is that there will be different ideological positions. Now, I would argue that you have, a, um, you have this sort of whole left right paradigm that kind of goes like this. So in a way, you're Keith Oberman, to use your example, right, is, I mean, is what he is. So it, 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 you, have a, you have a shift here. So it doesn't necessarily foreclose there being um, liberalish or left points of view. But what it does foreclose is, is arbiting, arbit being an arbiter between those views. Okay, so, there, so, so when you have institutions uh, such as, let's say, the New York Times, right? If, if they're going to write an article on health care reform or something, there will be voices positioned, but not necessarily an attempt to kind of work through uh, what might be the underlying 
public policy substance here. Thanks very much. It's subordinated. I mean, that's, that's precisely what I'm arguing here, is that it, 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 with the emergence of this new discourse, you have a subordination of that. I'm not, I don't want to argue here, I don't want anybody to misinterpret that somehow I'm saying that let's, it, empiricism or evidence-based study of public policy becomes wholly unimportant. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying, though, is that I'm arguing it, it's subordinated to this new concern. And this new concern is that it's more important to have um, different representations, right? It's more important to have a concophony of voices as opposed to trying to maybe dig a little deeper and talk about what will be the substance of, of this policy being proposed. It's a lucrative enterprise for those um, who are willing to, uh, or who, who, you know, accept the conservative uh, identity and, and are, are proponents of conservative policies. It can be very, very, very rewarding. I mean, to take but one example, I've, I did all sorts of study in the Broody papers on this very question. Not much, you know, it didn't really make it into the talk, but. Um, there, there's ways in which people are paid, even in the 1970s. I, 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 today, I'm a little less clear, let's say, what a fellow would make at AEI. But at the time, the money is pretty unbelievable to me, speaking as an academic who does this kind of intellectual work, who... Um, some figures here. Yeah, some figures. Okay, <laughs> some figures. Um, the uh, Irving Crystal, if they want him to partic participate in a conference panel, is paid three uh, three thousand dollars in 1974 to just sit for an hour and participate in a conference panel. Um, there's a study that's produced regarding si supply side economics by a fellow named Wininski in Wininski in 1976, and he is paid through the series of several grants uh, eighty thousand dollars for a nine-month period to produce a study which I argue in my work is shoddy, I mean, for lack of a better word. I mean, I was frankly quite shocked at how the, the sort of level of um, work there. This isn't to say this is, this is uh, the case across the board um, of the people I study, but for this particular example there was. It's lucrative. It's lucrative not only, obviously, for the... Baruti actually himself doesn't make a lot of money, surprisingly enough, though. In uh, the middle of the 70s, his annual salary is like $50,000. I was completely shocked. I assumed he's a, uh, a long-term ideological struggle guy, though. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. There are public. There are uh, sort of policy appointments versus publicity appointments. Uh, the the main example I would argue of the latter 
is uh, President Ford, who had this long-term relationship with AEI going all the way back to its inception. And then when Ford leaves office in 76, is brought on as something like a distinguished fellow at AEI, and he gets paid like $80,000 and to do nothing. I mean, to like, no, literally. I mean, he shows up to parties and gives a speech. And he makes a lot of money for AEI. I mean, I would do it if I were them. I mean, they put him on staff and, you know, uh, roll them in for a dinner and get, you know, a million bucks from the dinner. So obviously the, yeah. Thank you very much. I haven't found any examples of the latter. No. <laughs> I mean, there might, it might exist. In my research, I haven't found anything like that. Um, in terms of the diverse, uh, the sort of marketplace within the right itself, I, yeah, that definitely does exist. At this time, you do see Heritage, AEI, Cato, all sort of emerging up, who are speaking in, some, in many ways to different conservative identities. Uh, but at the same time, I tend to argue in my work that there is a sort of unity in that diversity. That despite the fact that they disagree on, on, on many things, um, that they can agree on things like uh, the nuclear family and personal responsibility are qualities to be valued, right? So I tend to push back, I think, a little bit against that classic kind of um, social libertarian divide. Thank you. Tell us, why was Heritage founded in 1973? Was that uh, a sign that they weren't happy or people weren't mm -hmm. happy with the American Enterprise Institute? Or was it just a diversification of views, as you said? And what was initially the difference between the two institutions? That's precisely right. There, um, there are people. The, the people that are doing this sort of funding call in AEI um, representatives to sort of talk through, okay, how you, how can you help us, right? And they give them money, as I talk about here. And through the 70s, AEI is the dominant organization. You don't see the real, I would argue, the rise of heritage until the turn from the 70s to the 80s and into the Reagan administration. But the difference I would say with Heritage is that Heritage is gonna explicit, explicitly position itself more as what Pat Buchanan described in his, in his memo, which is a Republican government in exile, a Republican government in waiting. So the way in which if, if and when we get a conservative administration, which obviously happens under Ronald Reagan, we can sort of funnel these people into it. And AEI is, is not quite that. I mean, what I'm arguing here is that there are something different, even though people from AEI obviously go into Reagan's administration, um, but there's a sense that it's going to be, that Heritage is going to be more of an activist Republican think tank. And that's why many, many more, you know, sign on to it. And the people who start it want to position it as explicitly that. Uh, initially, in the 1970s, AEI was still the predominant. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I'll take the first question first because I, I write about that in the first chapter of my dissertation. How particularly in the '40s and uh, I start saying book and not this first chapter of my book. Uh, the <laughs> the it, it, how in the '40s and the '50s um, there's really a transnational working here. Uh, the uh, institute all these names blend together. Institute for us uh, something enterprise in in Britain. Uh, they work with these, Joanna's work on, uh, you know, the, these sort of transnational uh, alliances between these conservative networks are really strong, even in the 40s and the early 50s, surprisingly. I mean, there's the Mount Pelerin Society, all of these uh, classic sort of uh, transnational uh, 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 allegiances. 
So yes, those are, those are definitely there and helped uh, the people I'm talking about all intersect with um, uh, you know, British economists and so on and so forth. Um, polarization, I mean, it's probably going back to Sabarno's question, I, I would say yes in some ways because you have a new discourse that fundamentally places as, as its highest value um, one's own identity, what one says one is. Uh, I would say yes, that does increase a polarization, but also I think the more fundamental point is this, this kind of sh shifting of the whole spectrum rightward that I'm arguing in my work, despite a polarization, really does benefit conservatism. Because you have this internalization of the critique that I'm talking about. So every reporter that's writing a story, every person at Brookings has this critique in their head, is sort of self-policing themselves. Right, so that so that allows this, kind of this to happen. Thank you very much. We may have time for a final question, Dr. Billington, please. I think it's a very interesting uh, uh, contribution to the general problem of interaction between serious scholarship and serious public policy for work, uh, and that is, might be a, another framework. Just conservative and liberal. Brookings, for instance, was originally the conservative opposition to the New Deal. Very much That's true. What it was set up as so, and then it morphed into a mm -hmm. place where people drifted from government, important uh, government service, and so forth. Uh, so, uh, with regard to uh, uh, AI, uh, one of the aspects of its evolution. was the, uh, particularly under Baruti Sr., was the uh, introduction of religion as a serious component yeah, absolutely. of public policy. His relationship with Peter Berger and various other people that he brought in there really introduced that. Um, and and that's, uh, that's been a, um, a factor on both the right and the left. I mean, you have the work of Bob Fogel, the one that Nobel Prize, uh, a work which has been generally neglected, talking about the four great awakenings <coughs> of how American social policy really was based and had a very direct relationship to, to uh, changes in the religious atmosphere mm -hmm. periodically. And so I think that the question of, um, uh, of the relationship between Public policy think tanks basically are organized around addressing and defined by problems. University scholarship is defined by departments, divisions of, uh, of the internet. And um, I happened, uh, Baruti was chairman about half the time that I was running and basically setting up the Woodrow Wilson <laughs> International Center for Scholars, which is another kind of think tank. Sure. And he was very supportive of my basic emphasis there, which was to organize it by regions and cultures of the world. Oh. Um, one aspect of his activity that's been, received very little attention, I don't know the extent to which it's discussed in the archives, was that his role as a kind of ecclesiastical statesman <laughs> behind the scenes. He devoted an enormous amount of attention um, to, apart from the AI, and apart from being the chairman of this institution, which, was, which he was perfectly supportive of my winding uh, uh, up to the the world, and of course, his son led these immigrants, right. basically. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and his statesmanship, for instance, within the Catholic Church and within the religious community more generally, was, uh, was one to encourage the conciliar direction huh. of the church, which was always much stronger in the East, where it had to compete with the orthodoxy, uh, Eastern Orthodoxy, which had this emphasis. And so as a kind of Lebanese Catholic, he was a very uh, influential in what would generally be considered a liberal. Oh, interesting. I hadn't heard that. Or at least partially liberal. Hmm. Right? I mean, you could argue whether he's liberal conservative. The whole cultural liberalism is a, a cultural 
conservatism is very, or liberalism, whatever you want to call it, or both, are very different from economic uh, liberalism and conservatism. So I think the general, my general point would be to congratulate you on a very nice um, uh, coverage of, of the element, Thanks. but to point out that, that there's a more fundamental cleavage uh, in, uh, in Washington and Washington's life between um, is there to be fundamental national scholarship in the humanities and social sciences mm -hmm. where there is in uh, art mm -hmm. science and medicine or not? Mm -hmm. Does the federal government have any role in it, either as a dispenser of money or as an ingester of ideas? Mm -hmm. And um, the Wilson Center certainly, at least during my time, he set it up as a center of basically on the side of fundamental scholarship uh, rather than uh, a vote of confidence that there is such a thing as fundamental research in the humanities and social sciences, quite apart from the social utility. Uh, or is the question of social instant social utility going to dominate the intellectual agenda? Uh, in the post-Civil War period, Washington was the intellectual and research capital of the United States. This was, it was not until late in the 19th century that the, uh, that the uh, university community went over to the German model from basically the British model. That is to say, formed around the library and the laboratory, so the fundamental scholarship spread out mm -hmm. over America, rather than the catechism in the classroom, which was the a British example, which is one of the but it was a really profound change. And with it, but, but it's interesting, the whole chapter, the words anthropology and sociology were physically invented in Washington in the post-Civil War period. You had the National Geographic Society, the Cosmos Club to take care of the rest of the Cosmos. There was an enormous sense of Joseph Henry, the greatest American physicist, the 19th century running the Smithsonian Institution. You, you had uh, uh, later the second appointee of the Library of Congress building this place up. You had the first international university in the United States, which was Howard, set up for the African American diaspora, not just for African Americans. You had the, the only uh, ecclesiastical, uh, the, uh, the only formally uh, Particularly consecrated university capital the people's major research, particularly capital university, major research has that suddenly the German university system is adopted in America, partly by the Moral Act, partly by the evolution of the more established universities. And so for a period, at one time, Washington was, was donated, dominated by fundamental research rather than public policy. Uh, what you're talking about is a period when public policy research became dominant, mm -hmm. and the organization of something like the, the Wilson Center, at least in those days, and, and the Clinton Center in these days, is based on the, the assumption that there is such a thing as fundamental scholarship mm -hmm. as a place that's sort of important alongside of, uh, the political life of the country, which is focused here, and the think tank world too, which is a mixture of advocacy and fundamental scholarship. Hmm. It's not that one is right and one is wrong. But I wonder if that, what should we actually be to that as a, as, mm -hmm. a, uh, as a way of approaching it, rather than <coughs> the definition of the liberal has changed so much uh -huh, yeah. uh, over time. That uh, liberal and conservative, well, are very important for maybe the more recent period of history. <coughs> How far do you think uh, this alternative view of the uh, that I've suggested mm -hmm. of the long term could or should be a form uh, of analysis, or do you think that the liberal conservative thing that is basically supporting one party or the other is basically the way to think? In terms of this, the broad question that you pose about the, the relationship of the state and funding the humanities more, more generally, I mean, I think uh, Donald Critchlow's work, he, he wrote about the Brookings a while back, late 80s, I want to say. And he, he makes, I think, an interesting case that I still kind of tend to accept, which is the reason you get this sort of uniqueness of the think tank in the United States is precisely because 
of a sort of schizophrenia in the United States about the role of the state and a generally sort of anti-statist orientation of much of US politics in comparison to France or Germany or, or, or elsewhere. So he actually makes the case that the think tank as we know it, whether we're talking about Brookings or AEI or all of these institutions we're talking about, uh, emerges in the United States precisely as a compromise, right? As a way through a, a, a sort of public-private blend to either do sort of general humanities-based scholarship or actual public policy-based scholarship. So, I, I mean, I always like his case when you're thinking about that broad question of uh, the uniqueness, you know, going to your issue of why, you know, why do we have this uh, this this open question in the United States that seems to be fundamentally decided in other countries, which is, yes, of course, you're, the state is going to uh, fund humanities in the same way it funds science. I'm biased in this direction. I want funding from the state. So, thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed. Let me thank you for a very stimulating and insightful talk and for a very active discussion. And it's clear that we all get a free copy of your book, I hope. <laughs> so let, let me thank you. Well done. Well done. Well done. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.